Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm here this morning for me, afternoon for you guys, uh, to talk about Samba 4 on OS2. So if you go to the next slide for me, Neil. Okay, Samba 4 on OS2. Uh, so what, what I'm planning to talk about um, today is firstly what is Samba for anyone who's been living under a rock and doesn't know what Samba is. Um, <laughs> a bit of an overview of why someone might want to use Samba instead of IBM here. A bit of history around Samba on OS2. Uh, what's new in Samba 4 and, and then the current status of where things are at in terms of binaries on OS2. And Lewis, feel free to interject if there's things I've missed um, <laughs> during, during the session because uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So, <laughs> and next slide, please, Neil. Okay. What is Samba? So, I, I cheated and copied and pasted this definition straight from the uh, front page of Samba. Okay. So, what they define Samba as is an open source or free software suite that provides seamless file and print services to SMB and CIFS clients. And in a couple of slides, I talk about what SMB is and what CIFS um, stand for. SAMBA is freely available, unlike other SMB SIFS implementations, and I guess that's a dig at products like uh, Windows Server, uh, Novell, I guess, the network to some extent, and back in the day, Warp Server would be another example of a non free SMB and SIFS implementation, and allows for interoperability between Linux and Unix servers and Windows clients. Now, in this context, you can replace Windows clients with OS2 clients, Android clients, uh, Possibly even Apple. I don't use Apple myself. Uh, clients as well. Um, Samba. In that definition, they primarily talk about Samba as a server, but Samba does also provide client services, which is what we're using uh, on OS2. So, yeah, Samba supports both clients and servers, and the client side is the focus of, of this presentation. So, next slide, Neil. Okay, but why don't we have IBM here? So, so yeah, uh, a lot of people will ask, hey, my, uh, I've got file and print services working using IBM Peer, why would I want to stop using that and start using um, something like Samba? Firstly, it's probably 20 years since IBM Peer was seriously updated. Um, it does work okay for connections to and from OS2 servers and probably with, with other older servers. But if you want to connect with something like Windows 10, or Windows Server, in most cases, or pretty much all cases, you'll have to compromise on security settings on those servers to get or always to get talking to those servers. Uh, things like the password authentication that IBM did is, um, is very unsecure, so you have to downgrade security settings on those servers to allow it to connect. It sends a lot of traffic over the wire in terms of uh, passwords and not very well encrypted. So, if anyone was tapped into your network, um, uh, uh, quite likely that someone could sniff your password out and you know break down security. So the, the comment there: most modern systems do not accept LM hashes and they're specifically configured for backward compatibility. And with newer Windows versions, that starts becoming uh, cool. Uh, finally, in terms of reasons not to use IBM here, is I don't believe it supports um, large files bigger than two gig. Um, whereas Samba for OS2 does, at least when it's used with Netflix 3 or above. Uh, next slide, please, Neil. History of Samba 3.x. Yes, yeah, so Samba for OS2 has existed for probably about 11 years. The first binaries I could find when I went to hunting through my memory banks and through Google, um, the first binaries were ordered by Nick Kay. Uh, and I think NetLabs helped sponsor that work in around the 2005 uh, period. In early 2007, um, I was trying to set up a Samba server at my house, and I have, we have a lot of digital photos of our animals, and particularly with things like extended attribute support, with that version of Samba server, uh, there are a number of bugs, and Nick Kay was busy on other things and couldn't update Samba at the time, so I started working um, on Samba to update the server to the latest version, which from from what I could find on, on Google was 3.0.24 at the time. Um, and that was mainly to provide better extended attribute support, but also I think the original builds were with libc version 05 to update the libc version 6 to provide some um, you know, better performance and some better quality uh, libc runtime. 
uh, to try to improve stability. At that point in time, other developers became involved in Samba, so people like Yuri, who I see is in the room, uh, Sylvan Scherer and Edward Bowfield also became involved to help work on that port. And to be honest, to a large extent, um, I lost interest, not lost interest, that's not the right words. Um, I stopped working on Samba and started working on other things because there was other people working on Samba. Um, I didn't need to spend uh, time on Samba. So probably for about you know, a good six, seven, eight years until last year, I hadn't touched um, the Samba code. So currently, uh, I build based on Samba 3.5 and 3.6. Um, important to note that from a Samba that I'll point of view, um, those code bases aren't maintained anymore and there are probably security issues with those um, clients and servers, which if you're using them in a home land, um, uh, probably isn't a major concern, but if you are using them over a big yet or in a corporate environment, um, it may be a concern. So next slide please, Neil. History of Samba 4. So uh, Lewis contacted me uh, somewhere in quarter one, March, April last year, I guess, Lewis, mm -hmm. um, last year, uh, regarding a client uh, that he's been working with who had engaged a security consultant, I think from memory, Lewis, mm -hmm. um, and their security consultant had concerns about the fact that they were using effectively SMB1 uh, in, their, in their land, and they had some of the security issues I mentioned a couple of slides ago. Um, and was strongly encouraging them that they needed to get rid of either get rid of that legacy software um, or move that uh, legacy software to using SMB2 or higher for security concerns within their network. So in this case, the client uses custom OS2 software. Uh, migration away from OS2 would have been a significant expense, both from a software development and, and also a training um, perspective. So. The key thing in, in, in their environment was they needed to get something called Kerberos authentication um, working with Samba, uh, working with Windows Server. And I think a few slides down the track, I've got a little bit on uh, Kerberos as well. What we first tried to do for simplicity, given that we already had Samba 3.5 uh, working uh, with NetDrive, is, uh, is get Kerberos support working with the Samba 3.x codebase. And from the reading we did at the time, it was suggested that Samba 3.6 should support um, SMB2, which is what the client needed. Um, however, once we got Kerberos working, we found that yes, it would work um, over SMB1, but wouldn't work over, over higher um, versions of that protocol. Mm -hmm. So it became obvious at that point that we had to look at porting Samba 4, um, which I guess kind of, kind of brings us up to the current time-ish. Um, one of the reasons, part of the reasons why I didn't initially jump straight towards Samba 4 is that the, uh, the, the build system, the method of compiling Samba changed significantly between uh, Samba 3 and Samba 4. And any time I looked at Samba 4, it used uh, a, a WAF build system, which used Python. Uh, it looked like an absolute nightmare, and it, and it was actually a bit of a nightmare, but we got there in the end. <laughs> so next slide, please, Neil. Okay, continued history of Samba 4. Okay. I should have read through my slides again this morning. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as I, as I mentioned, compiling Samba 4 required a bunch of work to modify the WAF build system used by Samba to make it recognize um, OS2 and, and the OS2 build environment. Um, WAF does use Python, uh, which at least we do have a working Python on OS2. Um, I was getting some crashes from Python um, when I first started working with WAF, but uh, was able to patch that within Python. And then once we had WAF modified, I was able to start working on compiling Samba. Uh, the first builds of a NetDrive plugin based on Samba 4.2.2 from memory were made available in about the middle of last year. And uh, as I mentioned, Lewis has done a lot of the testing here. Um, Current are based on Samba 4.4.7, which is the latest. 4.4 uh, security release as of uh, the middle of last week. So Samba 4.5 is out. Um, I haven't had an opportunity yet to work on that. The last few weeks have been pretty crazy at work. So the day job, unfortunately, has to take precedence. And next slide, please, Neil. What's new in Samba 4? So a lot of the stuff in Samba 4, and I, I tried to find a nice, neat um, summary of the changes from the, I guess, the Unix side of things of the uh, changes of Samba 4 over Samba 3. 
A lot of them do relate to um, Samba as a server. Things like um, people may have heard of the Microsoft Active Directory server. Um, Samba 4 as a server connect as an Active Directory server. Um, and there's also been a lot of changes to to support newer versions of the Samba protocol. So, and a lot of those um, changes also flow into the client libraries and allow us to interoperate with a wide range of servers. Um, the support for higher version for the Samba protocol also give better performance over Samba 3. So next slide, please, Neil. Okay, what is SMB? SMB, and this is a, a definition from Microsoft. Um, SMB is a server message block protocol. It's a network file sharing protocol, and as implemented in Microsoft Windows, it's known as Microsoft SMB protocol. The message packets that defines a particular version of protocol is a dialect, and the diffs, we, we saw a few slides back, common internet file system protocol is a dialect of, of SMB. So next slide, please, Neil. Okay, SMB versions, SMB1. So SMB1 is, is what we have in, in OS2 with IBM Gear, developed by IBM originally, um, with the aim of turning DOS interrupt local file access into a network file system. Microsoft has made considerable modifications to the most commonly used version. So Microsoft did a lot of that work in developing Land Manager, uh, which was an OS2 product back in the day in the early 90s. Um, and also added features to the protocol in Windows for Work Group, circa 1992, and later versions of Windows. So um, I guess back originally, you had to have you know, a Land Manager server or Land Server type product. And with Windows for Work Groups and subsequently um, OS2 Connect, um, that ability to share files between clients in a, in a, in a home network environment became and very easy and, and very cheap because there was no licensing fees or anything like that. One of the important notes on SMB1 is that any implementations that do exist have basically been reverse engineered because there is a lack of official documentation that defines mm -hmm. how that protocol um, works. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay, SMB2. So SMB2, uh, first introduced by Microsoft in, in that wonderful product called Windows Vista in 2006. Uh, whilst their version of the protocol is proprietary, the specification was published that allows other systems to interoperate with Microsoft operating systems that use that new protocol. So as evil as Microsoft is, at least they, at least they did do that. Uh, SMB2 reduces the chattiness of the SMB protocol by reducing the number of commands and subcommands from over 100 to just 19. Um, so that just helps reduce uh, traffic on the network and lets that traffic be used to carry data rather than carrying um, commands about uh, uh, the network and what's happening. SAMBA 3.5 has experimental support for SMB2 and they allege full support is in SAMBA 3.6. However, as I mentioned, we weren't able to get that working with Kerberos um, uh, back in the middle of last year. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay, SMB versions 2.1, 3.0. I lost something. Okay. Uh, We're back. SMB well, the audio two. was just dropping out then, so. Yeah, yeah. sorry. SMB uh, 2.1 and 3.0. So SMB 2.1 introduced with Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008, minor performance improvements with the new blocking mechanism. SMB 3, which was originally called SMB 2.2, introduced with Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012. Um, several significant changes, SMB Direct Protocol, SMB Body Channel, um, all intended to add functionality and improve performance. So there's lots of improvements to the protocol that we don't have with here, but we do have with, with uh, Sandra and OS2. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay, uh, 302, 311. So bringing us up to the current state, um, SMB 3.0 is release 2. Um, and really the main thing here is that due to the security considerations, they give the ability to disable SMB 1 um, within that protocol. SMB 3.1.1, uh, the latest and greatest, um, introduced with Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016. Um, client supports encryption. Uh, in addition to, to that encryption, uh, there's a, a higher, product, higher integrity security hashes and makes secure negotiation mandatory when connecting to clients that, that support it. So 
Whilst we don't currently turn on encryption in the uh, Metro client, we do have the ability to do that, and that's uh, one of the things on the to-do list to investigate. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay, what's this Kerberos thing? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll admit, Kerberos is one of those things that until Lewis started talking to me about it, I had never heard of. Um, but Kerberos <laughs> is a network authentication protocol that works on the basis of tickets to allow nodes communicating over a non-secure net Work, which I feel matter. Uh, design is aimed at primarily the client server model and it provides mutual authentication. Both the user and the server verify each other's identity. Uh, Kerberos <coughs> protocol messages are protected against eavesdropping and replay attacks. Next slide, Neil. All right, Heimdall. So, so when you look at uh, Kerberos uh, implementations, um, particularly Kerberos version 5, I think. Uh, I did, uh, I was yesterday morning looking at uh, one of Lewis's sessions on NetDrive, and I think there was a, a comment there about uh, Kerberos 4 being in OS2 in some form. Uh, this is specifically uh, about Kerberos version 5 authentication. Um, the most common of those two implementations in open source uh, are there's an MIT um, version of Massachusetts Institute of Technology and also Heimdall. In Samba 3, uh, MIT was used, so I spent some time getting uh, MIT Kerberos compiling and then found that in Samba 4 they switched to Heimdall. Um, within the Samba source code they have a forked copy, so they've basically taken a complete copy of the um, Heimdall source code and have it contained in Samba, um, which allows them to make their own fixes. Um, one of the problems though when you fork code is you've then got two sets of developers potentially checking in fixes that may make it into one release and not the other release. The other problem with Heimdall is that we're currently using the Heimdall 1.5.2 source from the official website. Um, no formal Heimdall release has happened since 2012. It looks like there's obviously some problems with the developers there or that, or that community and they can't get their, uh, can't get things together to get a, uh, a, another formal release out. So there's lots of fixes that are in the Heimdall repository that may one day get released. There's fixes in the Samba repository. Um, and Heimdall was basically a bit of a bad fix. Um, the MIT the guys are looking. Uh, there are some differences in the implementations between MIT and, and Heimdall, so that isn't uh, necessarily trivial. Um, so I'm also looking at uh, can I get the Heimdall release uh, from the Samba code um, working instead of using the system Heimdall. Um, but until we get a better uh, MMAP library for OS2, that's that's on hold. So next slide, please, Neil. Okay, current status, server. So I mentioned before on the on the on the server side of things, um, I haven't done any work on uh, porting the server component of Samba Four to OS Two. Uh, any patches that were in the source code previously from NetLabs um, I've applied, uh, but they may no longer compile cleanly. But there are current Samba server builds for Samba Three point five on the website uh, that's posted in the presentation. And really, depending on the levels of interest, I'm going to work on server components at some time. But my my calendar is pretty full, so um, the chance of that it probably is unlikely that I'll do that. But I know Sylvan has mentioned previously that at some point Bitwise will work on on Samba. But um, when that will be, personally, I think there's uh, more important things like GTD5 to work on. But that's uh, I'm a little biased there. Can you turn the video off? So you yeah, I don't know. Out so much. <laughs> We're breaking up. All right. Are we ready for the next slide? We've seen what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> you know there, Paul? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. OK. Yeah. Current status client? Yeah, so in terms of the, um, the client, the word. Just keep talking. Don't worry about it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you threw me because I've got a nice, nice reflection of myself on my phone screen now, and it was a little scary at this time of the day. <laughs> Seven o'clock on a Sunday morning, I should be in bed. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, in terms of the current client, um, feedback from testers, this client based on Samba 4 is pretty much the same in terms of stability as the previous um, Samba 3 builds. Um, benefits of the Samba 4 builds are they're compatible with a wider range of servers across many platforms and operating systems. And a lot of that is due to the support for SMB2 and higher um, connections. Um, just an aside there though, that there is a high number of dependencies um, uh, with the Samba 4 builds. With the Samba 3 build, it was pretty much a libc runtime and the NetDrive plugin. Uh, that was all that was required. Um, I think on the next slide, Neil, I've got a list of the current dependencies. Oh no, sorry, tested servers first. All right, I'm on current status client tested servers. Yes, you need yep. to. Okay. So in terms of servers and remote operating systems that have been tested so far, so I've tested here with a uh, OS2 server uh, running Campus 3.3. Um, uh, Lewis has tested with Novell. Uh, not sure that Novell Netware is the right terminology these days, Lewis, but um, <laughs> uh, Windows 10 has been tested. Uh, Windows Server 2008 and 2012, and there are with uh, Kerberos um, authentication. Uh, on the Linux side of things, Samba Server 4.2, 4.3, and also 4.4, and also FreeBSD um, running Samba <coughs> Server. And I think I did actually test with uh, my Raspberry Pi here that has Samba 4.3, I think it is as well, and testing the is a wide range of SMB versions. So, Certainly on the, on the Linux side of things, um, I've forced the protocol to SMB1 and it also allowed the client to negotiate the highest supported protocol and, and it works fine here. So no, next slide please, Neil. Okay, client current dependencies. <laughs> so as I mentioned, there is um, a, a higher list of dependencies. Um, so at the moment, there's no real easy way to install this. It's a matter of um, unzipping files. Um, at, some point we'll get to the point where, where we make this a little easy to install. But what we have is a NetDrive plugin, which is quite small, that just has the, um, the interface between NetDrive and Samba, it's only about 70K. Uh, we have an SMB um, uh, client support library, uh, which is about nine meg or so. And what that gives us the ability is when we, if we update um, Samba client support, you drop in that DLL and instantly the NetDrive plugin um, supports that new version of Samba. What it also means is the SMB client um, command line uh, FTP style for client uh, for Samba that uses that same uh, Samba client support library and minimizes the executable size of that. We have an LDAP DLL, uh, which is about a meg. Uh, Heimdall Kerberos support DLLs is about 10 meg. And there's also a, a libc extension um, DLL, which is about 100k, yeah. that libc extension DLL that uh, Dimitri and Bitwise are working on. Um, as you guys would know, the libc runtime hasn't been updated by Nuke for many years, really, in terms of adding functionality. It's been a couple of bugs. Uh, but the intent of that extension library is to support APIs that libc doesn't currently, and also to fix some that are broken. As, as an example, um, Lewis had a problem where when he rebooted his machine and he had a connection in his in NetDrive which was, I forget get now, was either to a Kerberos uh, server that wasn't always visible on the network or maybe one of his VPN uh, connections between his offices. Mm -hmm. And when he rebooted his machine and one of those servers wasn't available, he'd get a work by shell hang because the uh, Samba client would never actually tell NetDrive that that server wasn't available. That turned out to be a bug with the select implementation in libc and with the uh, fixes in libc extension. Uh, we had a hack workaround in place to, to, to get around that but with the libc extension DLL. Uh, we were able to remove that hack and get back to the standard Samba code uh, where Samba returns very quickly that the remote server isn't available and lets uh, OS2 continue booting. So I mentioned we will at some point uh, probably move to using um, uh, the Heimdall which is contained within the Samba source code. Um, that will eliminate that 10 meg dependency on, Heim on Heimdall. Um, we'll probably increase the size of the uh, Samba client libraries by a small amount, um, but we'll make things easier to install and easier to maintain as well. 
and hopefully Dimitri will soon uh, finish finalise some enhancements to memory mapping support in Glyph-C, which will allow that to occur. Uh, next slide, please, Neil. Okay, client current known issues. So um, there are some current open tickets for version three of the client that are visible in, in the report that I mentioned. Um, the, those issues don't significantly impact on functionality. There are some that are continuous improvement in nature. Uh, there are also some tickets from older client plugins that still affect the newer code. So the ticket 153 on Samba, slow performance with OpenOffice and PMView, got bottles with many files. Um, most uh, applications, when they get a list of files, um, do a single ask for a list of files and get a, and get a report on all the files in that directory. Um, OpenOffice and PMView, once they've done that, then do a specific query on each file in that folder. And the way the Samba plugin um, currently handles that is even though you've asked for the file data on, say, file name.jpg, it actually collects the data on, on with an asterisk with a wildcard. Um, and so if you've got a thousand files in a folder, uh, OpenOffice or PMView will ask a thousand times for the data on each individual file, but each time the sample plugin will request the data on all thousand files. So that leads on leads to a high, uh, high CPU load and high network load. Um, I know what the issue is, I'm just not sure yet how to fix it. Uh, hopefully I'll have about a three week vacation over Christmas when the plant shuts down for the Christmas shutdown. Um, so hopefully over Christmas I'll have some time to look at that ticket. Um, that, and that's one, as I mentioned, that's one that affects um, the Samba plugin based on Samba 3 and Samba 4. Next slide, please. All right, client current known issues. So one, one that has a pretty easy workaround but uh, does affect some systems. By default, NetDrive includes the NetDrive control problem, con control program, sorry, uh, NDCTL in config.sys. Um, what was found in some cases, and doesn't happen every boot, but when the system reboots, um, whilst it appeared in a way, share. So you can't turn the video off with this one? Yeah. Uh, Skype. I think it's like I would speed it up. We are uh, at the second floor. No, I can actually turn the video. Colors. Cool. It's a bit of a strike on that. Yes, Mike? Yeah, the, the, there is an issue you're breaking. Can you just for a while turn off your video and Talk. <laughs> okay, Paul. That better? Yes. Well, that, yes. That's probably much better. You guys as well not being able to see me. That's that's probably better. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead. So, did, can you repeat the slide? Do I need to start the slide again? Or yes, please. It? Yes, re repeat the slide, please. Okay. So uh, one of the issues um, we've had on some systems, but not all, um, is that uh, in the CTL, the NetDrive Control Program, um, if it's started from config.sys, uh, in some cases the system boots normally, but the Samba drives aren't available, it has some issues loading the um, Samba plugin. Um, what we've found is that if we load uh, in the CTL from startup of command instead of conflict or sys, um, the issue goes away. The reasons are currently unclear. Vitaly, uh, the NetDrive developer, um, has done some investigation on this, but unfortunately it works for him, which makes it hard for him to duplicate and reproduce. But the workaround is pretty simple at this stage, so it hasn't had a huge amount of priority yet on, uh, on getting that working uh, from uh, conflict or sys. Uh, directory caching isn't yet supported on SMB2 and higher connections. Uh, the way that caching code uh, is implemented doesn't lend itself to the way that Samba, uh, the Samba guys implemented the directory listing support for SMB2. So uh, Yuri is currently looking at um, caching support to make that code more generic to be able to, use, be, able to be used across multiple um, NetDrive uh, plugins. 
And once he finalises that ticket, I'll see what can be done to add support for SMB2 connections um, within Samba. In practice, however, I didn't notice any significant, I don't notice any significant differences between SMB1 and SMB2, even though SMB1 has directory patient and SMB2 doesn't. So again, I haven't put a whole bunch of effort into it yet, and I'll wait and see if once he refinishes that ticket, um, how easy it is to add that information. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay, uh, client source code and binaries. So, uh, we mentioned earlier that really this work uh, started because uh, Lewis has a client that uh, requires support. Um, the intent's always been to make the binaries and source available, and of course, source availability is a requirement of the uh, GNU public license. So, the client three code is already available in the NetLabs Samba repository. The Heimdall implementation that we have is available in NetLabs. Um, sorry, it's not the NetLabs Samba repository. Uh, it's the NetLabs Kerberos uh, repository. And a bit of a typo there as well with repository. Mm -hmm. um, and that works there to make it to create a DLL. And the Samba 404 source, I still need to get around to checking the NetLabs SVN, and I'll do that uh, the next rainy day. Though it's uh, heading towards summer here, so uh, that, could, that could be a while. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's about 25 degrees centigrade here today, so probably mid, mid 70s Fahrenheit. Do you hate things that still use Fahrenheit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay, client, can I test? So in terms of the client, um, we we do have a mailing list um, currently where there's a number of us, uh, uh, I, I post a link to the binaries and a number of people test those. But for now, um, contact me via email at the address here and request binaries and I'll send a link. Um, soon, hopefully, um, it's really just a matter of time, a lack of time really, um, everything will be available via the NetLabs website or my own website. Installation, as I mentioned, is, is currently a little painful. Need to make sure that LDAP DLL, Heimdall, and the extension DLLs are in the lib path. Um, copy the, the new Samba, uh, NDP Samba DLL into the NetDrive plugins directory, along with the Samba support library, and restart the NetDrive control uh, program. So, not too difficult, but it's, it's not automated currently. Next slide, please. Okay, client, reporting issues. So for reporting issues, um, the, the best way of getting something fixed is to create a ticket. Um, <laughs> the number of the email, the email I get, both in my personal email and also my work email each day is, is incredible. Um, so at least a ticket helps ensure that I don't forget that the, uh, the issue exists. Um, most cases, if you, if a bug report that says, um, you know, client crashes when I try and access files isn't terribly useful. Um, without some form of logs uh, or logging, um, it's very difficult to understand what happened unless there are very clear reproduction steps. And, and I can reproduce that in my within my home network, which I'll always try and do. But for, for the NetDrive plugin, and I think Lewis talked about some of this uh, yesterday in his NetDrive presentation, to enable logging, uh, Currently, with the sample uh, plugin, it's necessary to create an empty file .dbg in the root directory of the drive where NetDrive is installed. It will then be a log file log.ndp smb, which will be created in the directory of log files as uh, based on the environment variable in config.sys, which on an ECS install is c colon uh, or you know, the v drive c drive var log. Um, delete the log file because the log file um, continues to grow. Um, delete the log file and perform this with the plug. Uh, just helps to ensure that any old information from the logs isn't, isn't present. Um, it's logged to a ticket. All the clear steps on how to reproduce the problem. And for the last comment, be prepared to test updates that try and correct the issue or add additional logging to help understand the issue. And in some cases, it may also be necessary to turn on um, Samba client logging. Uh, but those client log, in most cases, the issue exists in our code, not within the Samba code. So just having the NetDrive logging is usually sufficient. 
Next slide, please, Neil. Okay. For my voice dies. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, client plugin dialog. Still there? Yeah, yep. we have the yep. client plugin dialog. Yep. So there are a couple of enhancements. Well, I'll, I'll call them enhancements um, to the current dialog. So over on the top right hand side of the dialog. Uh, previously, there was only a checkbox there to toggle whether EA support was turned on or turned off. Um, there's an added dialogue to, um, or checkbox to support KRV5, which is Kerberos authentication, um, and also one to force uh, NTLM, which uh, I forget the definition of that, but it's an older uh, modern protocol, which has been disabled for security versions in the SAMBA code, but for um, for some legacy operating systems, uh, like NetWare, I think it was, um, yes. is required. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's allow, allow support for older operating network. systems. Um, there are some pain in heart for the dollar. Again, comes back to time. Um, you know, frankly, having to create a text file in the root of a directory to enable and disable logging uh, is a little agricultural. Um, so I would like the ability to enable and disable logging uh, from the dialog and also enable and disable it by share. Also the ability to select a debug level and also to select the default protocol. So currently the pipeline will try and negotiate the highest version of a SMB protocol that the server supports. But in some cases someone may want to force that to a live version of a protocol, whether it be for testing or whatever reason. Um, currently, you can do that by editing the smb.conf um, SAMBA configuration file. But again, that's, that's uh, you know, not the most user-friendly uh, uh, that. So there are some planned enhancements to that dialog. Again, it comes down to time. And also, not wanting to make the dialog so busy and so confused that it uh, is, is confusing to the end user. So some of that may, if I can work out how to add a second page to the dialog, uh, or an advanced button that brings up settings for advanced users. Um, I haven't thought too much about that yet, just have some ideas on how to make it more user friendly. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay, credits. Credits. So, SAMBA 4 wouldn't be possible without support from the following individuals and organisations. So, if it wasn't for Lewis, who made the initial inquiries about what it would take to get a SAMBA build that supported Kerberos, and also he spent yeah, way, way more time um, than he probably has available in uh, <laughs> testing the binaries. Um, Dimitri, uh, the Kalix C extension library, there's some really useful fixes for Samba um, within that code that have been, you know, made it a bit, uh, able to uh, remove some uh, workarounds and make things work as they are intended. Uh, Vitaly for NetDrive and, and all his support. Um, Vitaly, I think uh, Lewis mentioned yesterday, he, you know, he, you send him a question, he never says no. He's always willing to look at and investigate issues, which is really useful. Um, all the testers of NetDrive Sandbag plugin version 3, which I've listed here, and of course also the Sandbag guys and the Kerberos guys. Because uh, without the code, it wouldn't be possible to support it. <laughs> and next slide. All right, thank you. Thank you for listening. Any, any questions? Everyone's looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask about server, that. but. <laughs> I, let me, let me Paul, it's Lewis. How are you, Mike? Hey, how are you, buddy? Uh, everyone's looking oh. at me. You, you asked if there were any questions, and everyone looked at me, I guess, because your face isn't up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably answer them almost as well as I can. Well, probably. <laughs> any questions? Anyone? I'll, I'll relay them to clarify them. No questions. Every, everyone's oh, an expert. Is, no. is that that live C <coughs> extension stuff? Will that be sort of melded back into the base thing? Or? That's the hope. That's the that's the plan. Um, it really depends upon Canute whether he's going to get back into that code or not. It's not like he's not coding. He's just coding on the platform. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> oh, is there anyone looking at the SAM, SAM before server at this point? Um, I, my understanding is that Bitwise has the uh, the SAM before server on their to-do list. 
Uh, Paul, do you know anything more about the uh, the server? No, I, I don't. I've, I've seen on IRC, Sylvan mentioned the you know, December 4 server at some point. Um, I don't know any more than that. It's not something Sylvan and I have talked about at all. I mean, he, he, he obviously knows that I have to find up and running because I am mailing this, but what Bitwise does is up to Bitwise. So that's sort of up in the air at this point. I, it, again, it's it it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it bubbles to the top of the list. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's lots of things to work on. Mm -hmm. We haven't tested the client against uh, Server 2016 yet. I have Server 2016 running in a VM, um, and it's not quite configured to test the client. But we fully expect that the client will work against Windows Server 2016. Well, we have, we have a tester that is tested using Windows 10, and Windows 10 and Server 2016 use the same protocol, so yeah, it should work. Mm -hmm. Have we tested the encryption on, on that yet, Paul? Oh, I haven't. Currently, there's no, the, I can easily have the code um, to enable uh, encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just not sure how to configure it on the server side of things, so I can easily add a checkbox like the Kerberos one. Uh, for encryption and so with it's it's half a dozen lines of code. Okay. What do you have to do to test this in a Windows server? Do you have to add the client to the oh. <laughs> <laughs> This one's yours, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well Lewis gave me a VM with it all configured already already so that I could just test. Uh, <laughs> how did you do that? <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, essentially, I, I I did a Windows 2008 release to server installation under VirtualBox yeah. under 64-bit uh, Linux. Yeah. I then um, uh, I configured that box to um, you know, for a shared directory that I created in in that uh, that server instance. And I then went to Microsoft and I got the documentation on how to tune the, um, the <laughs> Windows Server Kerberos um, performance yeah. and, the, uh, and the Samba uh, security levels so we could test the different levels of security. So those changes were all done using RegEdit. Oh, okay. <laughs> All of those things. Because honest to God, the, the Windows Server configuration tools are so lousy that I couldn't even figure out how to make those changes using their GUI. Okay. <laughs> so that was all done in using, using RegEd. Then uh, I took that and I created a... a Paul, did I deliver that to you as, a, as an OVA or did I... What did I do? Or did I just give you the right. VHD or, or the um, the VDI? I think it was just the VDI. Yeah, I, I think it was just the just the server, just the, the virtual disk image from VirtualBox, and that's what we use as our as our test bed. And I have a similar setup for uh, Server 2012. So does that mean that you can come up with any client that? you know, has the right credentials. You don't have to tell the server ahead of time that this client is going to connect. All I need to do is create a user account that I'm going to use to authenticate. So I created a user account yeah. on the on the server. Actually I created a couple of user accounts with different file system rights so I could yeah. see what the behavior was like of the client when I would connect and I would try to write to a directory where I didn't have rights, for okay. instance. So once I created that um, Windows, since Windows 2000, uses Kerberos authentication by default. Yeah. So really, it was just a matter of having a Kerberos client where I could request a Kerberos ticket from the server okay. instance. And then making sure that the Windows 2008 and the Windows 2012 server were in the same Kerberos realm. Mm -hmm. So I could authenticate against one server and make sure that I could access a share on the other server after I had a ticket from the first server, yeah. Kerberos ticket. Essentially, unlike the the um, 
the OS2 peer or the OS2 LAN requester, the authentication and the, uh, the file sharing components are broken apart. You've got Kerberos, which is really just an authentication mechanism. And then you've got Samba, which when it's, when it's configured to use Kerberos, doesn't do any authentication at all. It just says, okay, Kerberos says I'm allowed to go. Mm -hmm. Where's my drive? Okay. So you have, to, you have to really test the two separate components separately. You have to test authentication and make sure that you can authenticate. And then you need to test to make sure that you can actually move files back and forth. Okay. But is the server really running Active Directory? Are you part of Yes, the, the okay. server's running Active Directory. It, in, it's not an, an active participant in my e-directory infrastructure, because I run e-directory on, on Novell in my normal infrastructure. But I have an active, active Directory instance running on that Windows Server 2008 image. Okay. And then I added the 2012 server to Active Directory yeah. to that, that realm. But not the ECS client, or the OS2 client. Well, the OS2 client authenticates to Active Directory okay. via Kerberos. All right. It's not, it, Active Directory doesn't know that OS2 machine. It doesn't participate Interesting. as an Active Directory server or other Active Directory managed asset. It just, the user account is in Active Directory. Okay, that, that, Does that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I Good. was worried that I had to really have OS2 participate as a member of the Active Directory mm -hmm. in yeah. order to integrate it. Just the user account that you want to use needs to exist in Active Directory. That would be a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. okay, good, thanks. I, I was confused. Sure. And Kerberos is a, like there's a Kerberos server that you talk to to authenticate, right? Mm -hmm. So it, where is that running? Is that on the Windows server? Is Windows, it a, a Windows server acts as a Kerberos distribution center, a KDC. Well, that could be on a separate box. I guess in that configuration you just described it is actually, but it happens to be on another Windows server. Correct. In, in other words, what you can do with Active Directory is you can have one Windows server running Active Directory and it functions as a KDC mm -hmm. as well as a, a host for Samba shares. Mm -hmm. That's the way our test environment is set up. Okay. But you could very easily <laughs> have one server acting just as a KDC and all of your shares controlled by another server which participates in Active Directory. So when you authenticate against one, you access the shares on the other. And those other servers have to talk to the Kerberos server to say, is this guy okay or not? Well, that's, that's essentially the way that the tickets work. Works, you right. get a ticket from the ticket granting right. server, yeah. and then you present that ticket to the service granting server, the, the server that's got the share that you want to access, uh -huh. and you say, hey, I'm authenticated. And that server says, well, it looks like you've got a valid ticket, so go ahead. I know who you are. Like we use uh, Kerberos at work in my new job, and I log in once to Windows, but after that, like I go to a Linux box, I just put my username in and I'm Correct. authenticated. The, the miracle of Kerberos is single sign-on, uh -huh. SSO. Yeah, it's nice. And it, it's very nice. It's a very handy feature. Um, the other neat thing about Kerberos, the, the really secure thing about Kerberos, is that the password never crosses the wire unencrypted. Uh -huh. it, in fact, the password, uh, Paul, do you want to explain how the password works in Kerberos? Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I just can follow the code, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm listening and learning. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea is that the password never crosses the wire mm -hmm. unencrypted from the client to the server or back again. It's it's already hashed when it goes across the wire, and then the server says, does that match the hash that I have? Mm -hmm. So breaking it is pretty difficult. And are those hashes, like, refreshed from time? How does that work? Because mm. if you have the same one as if somebody it's gets that... Hard. The ticket expires is what happens. And you have to get a new one from you have to get a, You have to request a new ticket. See, so here's the interesting thing, and this is one of the first things that we, we kind of, well, we didn't stumble on it. We learned it when we were building all this. So ordinarily, you know, if you come out of a traditional networking setup, either a Novell setup or a, or a, a, a land manager setup, you log in, 
And until you log out, you're logged in, right? You're logged in forever. Kerberos doesn't work that way. Kerberos, at the server, you define the maximum lifetime of a ticket. By default, that's 10 hours. Mm -hmm. After 10 hours, if you don't specify a shorter lifetime when you request your ticket, after 10 hours, that ticket is expired. It's no good anymore. You have to request a new ticket. Now, there are a number of ways around that, <clears throat> and sometimes they make sense to use them. So, for instance, there's a, a Linux utility that <clears throat> built into the Linux screensaver. So when the screensaver comes on, it will request to renew your ticket for you <laughs> when it's sitting idle. Um, in some environments, that makes sense. In other environments, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it really does make sense to make sure that everyone's logged off after 10 hours and the machine isn't just sitting there idle mm -hmm. and connected. So <clears throat> you have this, this time out thing and so yeah, the ticket, the ticket expires. Tickets can be requested as renewable so that you can renew them. They can default to being renewable on the server. So then all you need to do, instead of going through the whole here I am, this is, this is my password, all you need to do is say, I have a ticket, I want to renew my ticket, this is my ticket ID, and the server says, okay, I've renewed your ticket. That's the way a renewable ticket works. When you want to log out, here's the other neat thing, there is no such thing as log out from Kerberos. You destroy your ticket. Once your ticket is destroyed, you're logged out. So if you think of it as you go to the movie theater and you get a ticket, and you walk out of the movie theater, if you've got your ticket, when you walk back in, they'll let you back in. Mm -hmm. But if you walk out of the movie theater and then you rip up your ticket, when you go back in, they're going to say, I'm sorry, you have to buy another ticket. So that's the way, the way Kerberos works. It's really a different way of looking at authentication. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's very, secure. very secure. One of the questions was, Windows, you can actually download free versions of those servers that last for a few months, right? Yes. You can. Is that what you do? That's what my 2016 implementation uh -huh. is, uh -huh. and my 2012 implementation right now. I think, I think my 2012 may have expired. So you have like six months to get this working, and then. Well, then <laughs> then we buy a license. Like we bought licenses for Server 2008 release two. Uh -huh. We, and you know, look, when you're doing development, you got to buy what you got to buy. Right. I right. mean, even if you have to go to the evil empire to get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else for Paul or for me? I really wasn't planning to be up here, but I just... Okay, just a comment. <laughs> just a comment. Um, so that you, you mentioned there are ways, much simpler ways, in an enterprise to configure Kerberos on your AD servers. Well... So the, the fact that you have just two in a test lab mm -hmm. means you're hacking the registry or mm -hmm. you're using the local policy, but in the, you know... It's about four, I, it's four mouse clicks. Glenn, no, no doubt that there are guys who work with Windows Server more often than I do who can get and find their way through the, the server setup stuff. I didn't have the time to go through the learning curve. I'm a Novell guy. I mean, really. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> it wasn't resistance. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Anything else about Samba 4 for Paul? Okay. All right, thanks. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul.